Previously, I've shown you two different ways to do a summary age trial balance for receivables. One using SmartList and one using Excel Refreshable Reports. Based on that, someone asked me how to do a detailed one for receivables, and that's what I'm going to show you today. And I'm going to do it using Excel Refreshable Reports because it takes a certain amount of programming um, to get it exactly right, or Excel formatting. And if you do it in SmartList, you'll have to do that formatting each and every time, as opposed to doing it in Excel Refreshable Reports, you only have to do that work one time. Pull up the Excel report and click on Refresh. So in my administrative view, on my navigation panel, I'll choose Excel Reports, and I'm going to double click on Receivables Transactions, and Excel will open up for me. And what will populate is the same thing as if I went to SmartList, Receivable Transaction, and went to Columns and added every single column. Now keep in mind, because this is the same thing as SmartList, it's just a data dump of all the documents. So it includes voided documents, it includes uh, payments and returns and credit memos, and because it's listing them as documents, those are listed as positive numbers and not the way they're affected, the way they affect the receivables transaction. So we have to account for those things as we're doing this particular format. Now there's two different approaches I could take. I could clean up the columns here and use this spreadsheet or this worksheet, but instead I'm going to use a different worksheet on the same or a different. Uh, yeah, worksheet on this same workbook, and I'll use a pivot table to create it for me. And then that way I have other fields available to me if I want to edit my pivot table in the future. Now, what I'm going to do right after document date is I'm going to create a column. So I'll just simply click on insert, and I'm going to give this column name debit or credit. And the first thing I'm going to do is let the, uh, create a field so that I know whether this is something that increases the customer balance or decreases the customer balance. And to do this, I'm going to enter in a formula, and I'm going to enter in a, it's going to be a logical formula, an if statement. So I'm going to say if, and I happen to know in column KK, because I've played around in this data dump, is the document abbreviation field, or the, it's basically the document types in an abbreviated format. So let me pull up KK, and there we go. So you can see SLS is sales, PMT for payment, and so forth. So now I'm going to say if it is equal to PMT, then I want it to be, whoops, I want it to say credit, and if it's not, I want it to say debit. And we'll go back, and you can see our column. Now I've accounted for credits are payments, but I haven't accounted for credit memos or returns. So this is where I would use the Excel nested uh, formulas. And today's purpose is not to show you how to use Excel formulas, but instead to talk about Excel refreshable reports. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy in the nesting for you. Just note you could have up to 64 nested uh, formulas in one formula in Excel. So my statement reads, if the abbreviation is PMT, it's a credit. If the abbreviation is RTN, it's a credit, and if the abbreviation is CR, it's a credit. Otherwise, it's a debit. And now I have a column that indicates whether or not it's a debit or credit. I'm going to add another column, and this one I'm going to call unapplied. So I can actually list the amount of the invoice that is left uh, uh, unpaid, or the amount of credit memo or payment that is not applied, and I can show whether or not it's increasing the account, uh, the customer owes us or decreasing it. So again, this is another logical statement, and I'm going to choose if, and I'll say if my debit or credit memo is equal to debit, that's a true statement, then I'm going to go out and find the field that says current transaction amount. Now, the current transaction amount, again, is just the amount that's left unpaid, as opposed to the originating transaction amount. And if it's not true, then it must be a credit, so it'll be that amount times minus one. Oops. There you go. And I'll click OK. Now it brought it in, it formatted it as a date, so I just need to change the format to a currency and select how I want my negative numbers to appear. And now I have my column for an applied amount. Now I want to add one more column here. I want to add a column for today. So I'm going to just call this today. And I can go in and add the column uh, called today and let it populate all the way down so it'll put in today's date as the format. But I'm going to manually override that and 
put in, well, I'll go ahead and do that. Just so you can see it today. And let's format it as a date. So now we can see today is formatted as um, today's actual date, February 4th, 2011. But if I want it to be um, a particular date in the future, let's come in and add 600 to that. Let's add 900 to that. I'm trying to get up to a certain uh, date in the future so that my reports will calculate a little bit better. There, that's good. I'm happy with that. Excellent. And I'm going to, you wouldn't do that, obviously. You would just keep it as today. I'll insert one more column, and I'm going to call this one bucket. Now, what I mean by bucket is, let's populate this in. In receivable setup, you set up your aging buckets. And so I'm going to manually create a field that determines what bucket, or what the bucket names are, based on the number of dates, okay, or past due fields. Now, to do that, I need to add one more field called days past due, or days due. We'll assume they're not past due yet. Okay, so for all my days due, I'm going to have it create um, a calculation of whatever's in today minus my due date. So let's go out and find the due date. And again, for the most part, these are in alphabetical order. Um, occasionally, they're not. I'm pretty sure due date is. There's due date. So today minus due date. And again, it formatted it as a date function. So let's change that to a number for the number of days. And we don't need decimal places. So now we can see how many days it's past due, if it, it even is past due, or how many days um, it will be due in. OK, so now we can create our bucket information. And our bucket information is um, basically going to be look at the field for the number of days due and determine what it should be in. For example, let's come in and do a logical test. If the days due is less than zero, then the true it is, I'm going to put it a one. I'll show you why I'm doing one later. We'll call that bucket current. If it's not, We'll, we'll leave it, um, we'll just leave it blank. Okay? Put in a zero. So some of these are current and some are have zero in them, depending on the field. Okay? Now, again, this is a situation where you'd want to do nested transactions. So you could account for all your buckets. And again, I'm not going to do that now, but um, if we now we have it, if the days due is less than zero, it goes into current. If the days due is less than thirty, then if it's if it's not less than zero, if the days due are less than thirty, then it's zero to thirty, and so forth, building it all the way down. So now you can see I have different days um, over and short, um, working my way down. Oh, let me change that. There we go. Got rid of that little extended piece. So now we're ready to begin our pivot table. So we'll click on a new worksheet on the same workbook and I'll click Insert it, uh, and Pivot Table. And it asks me which range of data I want. So I'll go back to my original worksheet. I'll hold my mouse down on column A and go and select every potential column. Again, I like to do it th this way because then I have ability to add other kinds of things like um, number of days to pay, um, what is the original amount of the transaction, and so forth. So let's go and grab every potential column. all the way to LD, and I'll click OK. And let's begin populating. We'll add the customer name into the rows, and you'll notice it automatically populates. And under that, let's add the document number. We'll just drag that down under rows. And you can see it actually creates an outline format, so I can collapse and review customers one at a time. That's really beneficial when you're evaluating a customer account. In the columns, let's go in and put in what the information we had for buckets. So now we can see our buckets. And the reason that I had it, us put a one, two, three, just number our buckets essentially, is so that they would automatically appear in the order we wanted them to appear. 
I'm going to remove blank as from the budget bucket list. Now let's go and drop the unapplied amount in the values. And you'll notice it's just counting them right now. So let's click on the drop down list, change the field value to sum, and we'll click OK. And now we have dollar amounts. Oop, let's go back to the field value and change the number format to currency and set the way we want our negative numbers to appear. And we have all that information. We have a lot with zeros in there, so we're probably including a lot of transactions that should not be included. So what we want to do is let's scroll down to find document status. This is a good reason not to remove account, uh, columns if you don't need them. We put that in our filter, and now we can come up and say we're only interested in posted. History would be items that are had the uh, status of hist. Posted would be open, and unposted would be work. So we'll just want posted transactions, and you notice how much cleaner that is now. Now one of the things I like to do is it's hard to tell what kind of transactions these are. So I like to go up and add the document type. So I'm going to add the document type to the row labels. Now that's a bit junky. It has the document type right before each uh, do or under each document. So I'm going to drag it here and move it up between the customer name and the document number. So now I can look at each particular kind of document and collapse those if I'm interested. So for example, Aaron Fitz Electrical, I could just review finance charge doc information right there and see how that works. So that's a pretty cool feature. Now we also need to include whether or not the transaction has been voided. We want to make sure we exclude all voids. So we'll find void status in our list, drop it in the report filter, and make sure we tell it to only show the normal transactions. Okay, awesome. I'm going to pull over the um, inquiry window for Adam, or, um, let's go to Aaron Fitz Electrical, and we can see, let's collapse him, and pull that information back up. Oops. There we go. We can see his balance is 31,195.59, and his balance here is 31,195.59. Adam Park Resort, 2809, 2809. So we've accounted for everything, and it looks like our numbers are working for us extremely well. So that's fabulous. Now, because we have all the tr information out there, we can even add a couple other pieces of information if, to it as well. For example, I can go and add currency ID. Now, when you're choosing currency ID, make sure that you click currency ID as opposed to currency ID from master number. Currency ID will be the kind of currency the invoice was entered in as. The one from the master is just the one that's the default. So now you can come in and say, show me all of the transactions that were done in the UK. Now we're just looking at the functional currency amount, so you'd have to add a, uh, some field information in there if you wanted to be able to see it in the UK currency. I'm going to click back to just US. and. This is a great report and a great way to show it. You can add a, a chart to it if you want to. It's, um, it's a little hard to read exactly the way it is when we're looking at it like this. Let's uh, open up payments. So you can might want to click on Pivot Tools, Design, and then you could use some of the table formatting. Um, I like the green. So there. I hope you use this in your business well. And um, as always, I hope this helps. Bye.